Hi everyone, my name is Tori Kai, and welcome back to Round the Mulberry Bush. I wanted to apologize right now, um, in the last video, <laughs> I was losing my voice. I'd been recording non-stop because I was just so interested in what was going on in this one, and I kind of went ahead of myself by trying to just burn through the <laughs> last few chapters. And apparently, this, I, yeah, I reached my limits and decided I had to cut it short. And man, I'm gonna be doing some major editing in that <laughs> just so it doesn't sound as bad, I guess. But uh, I've rested, so let's let's get back into this. Um, so last time we found out Maddie's growing up, obviously, because she's not nine years old anymore. Um, and this is upsetting Oliver because he likes that, you know, spunky little wild child that she was, because then he could like um, say that they were on equal footing. But he's extremely creepy about it versus being very romantic because instead of just admiring all of her um, traits, he's just very possessive. Uh, yes, I mean, wanting to claim, you know, her freckles and her bruises and it's just weird to me. <laughs> so, yeah, anyways, we'll, we'll just see what happens because we've, we, I think this goes on for seven years, right? So I'm on the sixth one, so there's one more after this. And uh, let's get back into it. <laughs> when we were younger, we lived in one another's pockets, a phrase my mother always liked to use. We were almost inseparable, though our respective classes would have made separation so simple, so easy. But we clung together all the same, invariably meeting beneath the old mulberry tree. She grew more and more distant as she became older and prettier, but I had tried to tell myself, hopefully, so hopefully, that this was not Maddie's fault. It was because of her parents, and her tutors, and her ladylike duties, and her, oh, I don't know, her commitment to French verbs, and the conjugation thereof. But they were just excuses, flimsy as the petals of a flower. Matilda was not avoiding me because of happenstance, mere ill fortune. She was avoiding me because she wanted to avoid me, and she no longer felt comfortable with me, and she did not like me. The time for liking stable hands with sunburnt skin, who smelt of sweat and sawdust and horse manure, had passed. The times when Maddie and I could be happy together, were gone. I knew that only too well with a pain knock against my rib cage when I saw Maddie, Matilda, Lady Addison taking a turn in the garden with another prospective beau far more appealing than the last season's Lord Burlington had been. I knew Matilda found him more appealing, and this supposition was not based on his looks, fair hair, soft eyes, a daydreamy smile that bespoke of introverted interests, dusty books and fresh ink but on the way she addressed him. She did not, as she had done with Lord Burlington, hold him at the verbal equivalent of arm's length, her laughter hollow, her smiles fixed and forced. She did not address him by his last name. She called him, quite simply, as though any relationship between a man and woman, both of high standing, with a fair amount of money to their much exalted names, could be that simple. Meredith. Meredith Asher. A person I knew I would never, no matter how many summers came to pass, be able to compete with. How could I? When he had been born into money, and I had not. I had not realized this fact when I was a small child, but it became abundantly clear as I grew older. Those who had money and lived with plenty had a certain look about them an expression that settled upon their countenances, quite comfortably, like dust on an old furniture. Smiles. They were often writhed with smiles and made light conversation and spoke in lilting tones like falling rain because they could afford to. They could be genial and pleasant and curtsy or bow and shake hands when required, neither gripping too firmly, not too feebly, because they lived charming lives and had never needed to bother themselves with the drudgery of hard labor. 
Their effortless, easy charm had been bred into them and nurtured by their wealth, their riches, their slowly swelling pride as they grew older. They were a different species. They were like peacocks, and I was a mere pheasant. I felt guilty for even watching Matilda and Meredith, and I had not intended to watch them either, for even though I was curious about Matilda's affairs, I would always be curious. Knowing she went to dances and ate dinner and engaged in light conversation with men who were so far above my own social station was painful, and I could hardly do anything about it. I did not see the point in torturing myself over something I could not change. When I happened upon Matilda and Meredith, however, I found myself incapable of turning my gaze, though... I should have been delivering a barrel full of hay to the stables. I do not know how long I stood there standing, staring, only that I did stare until the summer sun burnt my scalp and seemed to bleach my hair. And then Matilda turned and saw me and started to giggle, holding one hand against her lips as though the expression of pain that must have clouded my features was amusing. Well, I was overjoyed that my suffering caused her such inexplicable pleasure so overjoyed it made me feel nauseous and i had to duck my head lest she notice how my teeth gripped together and my cheeks turned pale after that i tried to avoid matilda which should not have been overly difficult given our roles did not lend us to spend much time together and i had hardly interacted with her for some four or five months in any event, but... Oh, is that you, Oliver? Life, as I had learnt, has a nasty habit of surprising you when you least desire to be surprised. She was standing beneath the mulberry tree, as she had been when I first met her, but she was taller with willowy limbs, and her skin was smooth, soft, clear. Those familiar freckles were still splashed across her nose, like stars in the sky, but her fingers were pure white, untainted by the black-red juice of countless berries. It stood to reason. How would she be able to sew or play the piano or style her hair with fingers splattered with juice up to the knuckle and seeds wedged between those fine fingernails, even more delicate than bone china? I opened my mouth, my throat dry, and realized I did not know what to say. I did not know what to call her. Maddie? Matilda? Lady Addison? None of them sounded quite right. As I stared at the woman before me, not a girl, but truly a woman, her face seemed to mix and merge together, a broken mirror reflecting fifteen different people, distorted. What Maddie had been to me, and what she was now, I couldn't reconcile all the contradictory images. I squeezed my eyes shut, pressing my hand against my temple. I could feel a headache beginning to stir beneath the surface, so my eyes prickled inside my skull. Oliver, she asked, with her round vowels and her false concern, are you all right? I wrenched my eyelids open with every last bit of willpower I possessed and tried to nod. The motion was jerky, but I managed it nevertheless. I did not want to appear weak in front of her. I had already seen how she had scorned my weaknesses, and I did not want to become another joke exchanged between herself and Meredith in between diatribes about the over of Bach. That was what affluent men and women spoke of, wasn't it? Composers and artists and architects. I did not know. There was no way for me to know because I would never be invited to engage in such exciting conversations. I don't know if I can call that exciting. <laughs> I feel f fine, I told her, trying to exercise the tremors from my tone. I should be going back to the stables. 
You are always at the stables nowadays, she said archly, her brows raised. Yes, I am, I told her, because that is my job. True enough, she said with a small laugh. As attending balls and playing bits and pieces of the piano for those who inquire about my so-called skills is mine. I am sure you are very skillful, I said, trying to match the disdain my tone to her own. I did not know whether she was skillful or not. I had never heard her play the piano, though I had heard her complaining about it countless times when we were younger and the world had been so much simpler. When I had understood Maddie and she understood me and we had fit together despite being two odd dissection pieces in perfect harmony, I could not understand her now. That is what Meredith says, she told me, her voice soft. He is fond of my piano, though he must know, being a musician himself, that my technique is laughable, childish really, if only I had paid more attention when I was younger. If you had paid more attention, you would not have been Maddie. My Maddie. I had to bite down on my lower lip to stop myself from uttering the possessive. I suppose I would not have been, she said. Honestly, I feel so sorry for my tutors. I must have been a menace, always running around barefoot, tracking dirt into the carpets, twigs in my hair, a hellion, Satan spawned. But I had far preferred her like that. I take it Lord Asher is quite smitten with the lady, with the current Lady Addison. Yes, she said distractedly, and either she did not hear the bitterness that had edged its way about my words, or she did not care to correct me. She was a lady after all, and she had better things to do with her time than to correct the words of a mere servant. He is quite smitten, she said. I had known as much, but hearing it confirmed with her lips, and so casually too, as though it made not one whit of difference to our relationship, stung. Her words were like knives, they cut right through and out the other side. That was one thing about her that had not changed, though her eyes were less pointed, less intense. She no longer smoldered, brilliant and bright, but she continued to flicker a few dim embers left dying by the hearthside. Soon, Lord Asher would sweep them away. He would ask for Maddie's hand in marriage, and her parents would agree to the union, because he was wealthy and so very polite, and Maddie would agree because she had been coached in the art of agreeing with two men, wealthy men, not stable hands, since girlhood, and though she tried to rebel, the pointed parts of her personality had been filed down, whittled away, slowly but surely over the years, over the long string of successive summers. The mulberries on the tree looked less beautiful than once they had done. The colors washed out, unreal. I hardly believed my own eyes. Maddie, I said softly, the words breaking past the barrier of lips, before I could stop them, cram them back in, though I already regretted them. I had a good many regrets. I still do. Oliver? Why are you being so pliant? This is not like you. Pliant? She raised a brow, nearly plucked, that arched above her right eye like a halo. You believe I am being pliant? That's right, I said. You are being pliant, horribly so, by allowing yourself to be charmed by a wealthy Lord Ladida. Lord Ladida, indeed, said Maddie, and her nose wrinkled as she sniggered. 
for a few moments, she looked so much like my Maddie, unkempt and elfin in her mean spirit amusement, that I wanted to crush her with my chest and hold her close as I had done when Crabapple died and kiss her. I wanted to kiss her neck and cheeks and lips and the other areas of her skin that were off limits to my prying eyes, skin that was warm and flushed, glowing beneath the ribbons and lace that attempted to conceal it. But her clothes could never hide just how beautiful she was. She was even more beautiful when she sniggered, childish once more, the spawn of Satan that had driven so many tutors to distraction with their mournful moans and sighs and petty complaints. This girl is a law unto herself. She is utterly unteachable. But they were wrong about that, because Maddie had been taught, despite her attempted resistance. She had been taught and she had learnt, and her newfound knowledge had filtered through her childhood innocence, her childhood naivety, her simple childhood selfishness, and had worked her. Lady Addison stopped sneering, and the wrinkles in her nose subsided, and her expression was once more careful, controlled. Do not call Meredith that, she reprimanded me. He is a fine gentleman, and I like him. And that was what it all boiled down to, really. He was a gentleman, and I was not. You say that you like him, I said, and I cannot deny your feelings. I do not know him well enough. I am sure he is a fine man, but if you cannot deny it, do not speak further, she advised me. There are some things you do not need to say. Not even to you? I thought we shared everything with one another. There was a time and place, but this is not it. The place is still the same, I said, glancing at with a certain amount of sadness about our secret bower, our mulberry tree. Lady Addison Matilda, Maddie, shook her head, and for a few moments I thought she looked just as sad as I felt. But the illusion did not last very long. The place may be the same, but the time has gone. And she said it so simply so perfectly, so beautifully, there was nothing more to add, and there was nothing more I could say. And she was correct, not just in her manners, and her breeding, and her clothes, and her hair, and her skin, but in her words. Irrefutable. The place was the same, but we were not the same, and the time had well and truly gone. Where, oh, where did all the time go? 1795, the seventh summer. By the seventh summer, Maddie had ceased to exist. There was no more of that naughty, ill-behaved little girl, the one who had stolen mulberries from the tree sneakily, serotipiously, and popped them one by one into her tiny pink mouth, smearing black-red juice all over her cheeks. That Maddie only existed within my own mind now, bright and bold, while all else around her was sad, wan, and tinted with sepia. Maddie could not be diminished, not even, instead, my head. Not even inside my dreams. No matter how much time passed, I would always remember Maddie how she had been. No matter how much time passed, I would always remember Maddie how she had been. A ball of messy blonde hair and dirty fingernails, rucked up socks, and clumps of mud stuck against the heels of her shoes. But remembering did me little good, and offered no respite when contrasted against the girl she had grown up into. No, not girl. Woman. Maddie was no more. Lost to me, like laburnum pods scattering with the exhalations of the air. It was something I had suspected, 
though darkly, grimly, with a sense of trepidation and pained ache, a knot of stress in the seat of my heart for a long while. Now that I could see her standing beneath that mulberry tree, her hair cornflower blonde like a halo, I finally knew. She had not spotted me watching her, at least not yet. Her head was ducked, a coil of hair cascading over one soft, pale pink shoulder, and her lips were curved upward into a small, silly smile. Her right hand was held before her, the finger spread, and a gold band glistened on her ring finger. Once the mulberries nestled away amongst the green leaves, and even more appealing when contrasted with the dun-colored branches, had been the precious jewels that caught Maddie's attention. Now, it was the ring that sparkled on her finger. So, she was lost to me. That little girl with the wide eyes and the high forehead, smooth like an egg, always getting into scrapes and bruising her knees and infuriating her mother, but captivating me, was gone dead and buried. Even from a distance, I could tell the ring that adorned her finger was expensive. Of course it was. Lord Asher would never have insulted Lady Addington with a cheap ring, especially given it was to be a physical representation of his ardor, his passion, his devotion. I could not imagine a fair-faced half-foreign man like Meredith Asher was being particularly passionate, and the thought was enough to make me feel faintly ill, but it was what the bauble that decorated Matilda's finger signified nonetheless. Love. So he loved her, or at least he believed that he loved her, and Matilda? She must have loved him too. I could have tried to argue the point. And I did try. I tried desperately. But I knew it was all foolishness. If she did not love him, she would not have accepted his vow. She would not have accepted his ring. Matilda may have changed a great deal since her girlhood, but I like to believe her core values had not shifted. I wanted to think, I so desperately wanted to think, that she was not the kind of woman who would promise her heart to a man she did not love. I could remember clearly the pact Maddie and I had made all those years ago beneath this tree. So this is our little secret, right? That's right, our little secret. Innocent words, childlike, that had been sealed with a mouthful of mulberries, sharp black juice exploding inside my mouth against my tongue. How vast and important, all-encompassing, those words had seemed to be back then. How little they meant now, almost a decade later, now that Matilda was older, and a wedding band was fitted around her ring finger. She was going to be married. She was engaged to be married. And though the thought was painfully, unbearably so. I hope she did love him. I could not imagine anybody loving Meredith Asher, who seemed too soft, too vague, too ephemeral to be loved by anybody, least of all a woman like Matilda. But I hope that she did all the same. If she did not love him, and she had accepted his proposal merely for the sake of wealth, or status, or her parents' approval, I would have hated her. I would have loathed her, truly loathed her, and I would not have been able to live with myself. I would not have been able to live in a world where the woman I loved more than anybody else had allowed herself to become so warped. I had to know, I had to ask her, though I knew the answer would be painful no matter what single word syllable would fall from her lips. Yes, in which case, though I would still love her, she could never love me. No, 
In which case, though there was still a chance she could love me, I could never love her. Lady Addison? I attempted, my voice soft, hesitant, afraid. I had been afraid when I first met her, beneath the leaves of this mulberry tree, two small insignificance sheltering from the sun. I had known back then, though she was younger than me and smaller, with big eyes and dainty feet and tiny hands, that she would one day destroy me. It was inevitable when she was so very high above me in social status, but I was so very in love. I had always loved her, ever since I met her. Oh man, she definitely grew up since the last one. Ah, Matilda blinked her lips parting into a small O oh, of surprise and lifted her head. She brushed a few strands of blonde hair out of her face behind her ear. Her motions were so graceful, so well practiced, worlds apart from the awkward mannerisms of her youth, that it hurt. Every word she said, every action she performed, every expression that crossed her countenance was painful. The mere act of breathing in the air, infused with the scent of mulberries, suddenly sickly sweet, made me choke. Oliver? asked Matilda, and she looked strangely guilty, as though she'd been caught in some secret ritual. It has been quite some time. That was how all our interactions began. It has been quite some time. We rarely spoke to one another now. We, who had once been so close, had been rendered little more than strangers. I wondered if we were to be lost in a crowd, adrift amidst a sea of people, whether she would be able to recognize my face. I could pick out hers, whether we were tempest tossed amongst 100 people or 1,000, but could Matilda do the same? Probably not. Not when she had that ring on her finger. Not when she had fallen in love with somebody else. It would be improper for the future wife of Lord Asher to fixate upon a mere stable hand. Unthinkable. Why then, had I allowed myself such thoughts? Lady Addison, I swallowed and shifted and ran a hand through my hair, but nothing helped lessen my nerves. Is it true? She did not need to ask what I was referring to, because she knew. It must have been obvious. I am to be married to Meredith, yes. Oh, I see. I said, and I paused because I did not know what else to say. And for how long? He asked me at the beginning of May, so three weeks ago, I suppose. Three weeks? She nodded. Three weeks? And you did not think to tell me why? I winced, and I knew my expression was contorted into something raw, something ugly, but I could not hide the true nature of my feelings from Maddie no matter how hard I tried. I had never been able to. I am really- I am feeling bad for him because he definitely has no chance. <laughs> this is kind of reminding me of, uh, of Emily is away, like just the whole drifting apart over time and- but this one has the added stance of them being in completely different social statuses and the other one was just you know he just did not have any guts to, <laughs> to do anything <laughs> oh man i just i feel so i do feel bad for him i loved her too much i loved her and i wanted her to love all of me anything else would have felt like a lie a sham and I would not be able to survive knowing I had tricked her, 
whether unwittingly or no. But it was foolish. I was foolish. Matilda would never love all of me. Not now, when she did not even love a part of me. I'm sorry, Oliver, she said, holding her hands at her front, her eyes downcast. It did not make me feel any better. I just thought... I did not have a right to know? Well, we did not talk to one another like we once did. I did not know if such affairs would interest you, and I assumed Bertha would have told you already. But I would have rather heard it from you. I apologize, but I've been so frightfully busy lately, it fell by the wayside. It was nice to know just how highly Matilda thought of me. The wayside. She might have just as well said compost heap. Moreover, Matilda frowned. She no longer looked sorry. Instead, she seemed stronger, bolder, more resolute. I have no reason to explain my actions to you. You might have been dear to me once, Oliver, but the fact remains that you are a servant and I am a lady. It would not have worked. And she was right, of course. It would not. But I had left myself believe. I gripped my teeth together so hard I feared they might splinter. Though her refusal, blunt and frank, and without any kind of ladylike grace, should have hurt, should have made me hate her, it did the opposite. It made me love her more than ever, because it let me know the girl I'd fallen in love with, my Maddie, still existed somewhere beyond the ruffles and ribbons and lace. For a moment, though, though scant, her expression looked so much like my Maddie's, I felt my heart skip a beat. Maddie. I said, and my voice no longer trembled, because I was sure of myself now, sure than I ever had been. I was a fool to doubt it. Perhaps I had not loved her as much as I thought, to think that she might betray me so deeply, to think that she, Matilda Addison, would ever marry for social standing and not for her own feelings. She was too earnest, too honest, too open for that. She always had been. She always had been and always would be, and I thought she would was much changed, and she did not love me. I loved her, and I knew I would always love her, and the thought was enough. It was more than enough. Oliver, what are you? But Maddie's voice was cut off utterly completely oh my god please don't kill her <laughs> please don't kill her don't okay <laughs> okay I can breathe <laughs> oh man before I knew what I was doing I found myself kissing her she tried to push me away her fingers pressed against my chest but I did not relent I had loved Maddie for so long as long as I could remember and I had wished to kiss her more than there are stars in the sky. More than there were mulberries festooned in the branches of the mulberry tree above our heads. I had wanted her for too long, and I had loved her for too long, and I could not let her go. If I did, I knew I would never get the chance again. Our relationship would be ruined irreparably. It had been the slow, painful progress of disintegration for years, fueled by Maddie's own disinterest. But this act of misconduct on my part would ruin everything. She was to be engaged to a lord, and I was a mere stable hand, a man who tended to the horses. She was now too refined and too elegant to ride. I could never be anything more. I was overstepping my boundaries grossly, and my life serving the Addisons, the life I had built for myself, of feeding rosemary sugar lumps and joking with my father, and exchanging idle gossip with Bertha, would be ruined, 
dashed in one fell swoop, like knocking a bottle of ink over a piece of parchment. I'm so scared. Please don't do anything. Oh no, he's going to do something awful. So I could not let her go. Please don't be one of those people who are like, I have to kill her because if she can't be mine, she'll be nobody's or something. Oh, don't be creepy, Oliver. I could not let her go because when I did, everything would come crashing down around me. The happiness I could feel blossoming inside my chest, pounding so hard my heart threatened to burst into a macabre shower. The happiness I would no longer feel and would never be allowed to feel again as I would be dismissed from my position, flung away carelessly without applause like refuse. This was the first and last time I would ever be able to kiss Maddie. I had to make it count. I had to let her know how I felt. This isn't romantic, dude. <laughs> Stop being creepy. The harder she tried to resist, the closer I pulled her against me. Her chest was pressed against mine, and I could feel her breast rising up and down, panicked, her heart pounding as quickly as a baby bee bird's. She was so soft and warm and full of life. She was still Maddie, my Maddie. Oh god, please don't kill her. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> I had insulted her before, many months ago. I had called her pliant. She was anything but. She was not pliant in the slightest, and she did not acquiesce since to my embraces. She had fought bitterly every single step of the way, trying to claw at my flesh, drawing a thin line that bubbled blood, and her teeth bit against my lower lip. But I did not let go. I could not. I could not fathom how I managed to survive so long, seven long, painful years, without holding the object of my affection close and inhaling her scent, tasting her saliva and letting her know, without words, just how much I loved her. She is not into this. Just, ah, uh, you're being greedy. Uh, I would lose myself if I let her go now i would go mad perhaps i had already started to go mad yes you were crazy a long time ago <laughs> let's be honest <laughs> i pushed her back against the bark of the mulberry tree or childhood haunt or secret hideout and i suppose i was too rough and it must have hurt because she whimpered and tried to resist but her arms are slender and delicate and she could not Oh, crap. She might have been a lady of a far higher social standing than myself, but such distinctions did not overly matter. When I had her pinned in place, my lips smashed against her own so she could not even scream. Everything was meaningless except her and the smell of her skin and the blood that coursed within her light blue veins. Oh, I'm, I'm so scared. <laughs> Don't do anything stupid. <laughs> she bit down on my tongue hard and I tasted blood. It bubbled up inside my mouth like a spring tart and bitter like the mulberries, black red, but I could not stop kissing her. I could taste blood and I wonder if she could taste mine. My blood in her mouth against her tongue, the fruits of her labor, her attempted escape. An escape that remained nothing more than a fleeting concept, a childlike hope, because I would not let her go. I was glad that she fought, not because seeing her distress was particularly arousing, but because it reaffirmed that, more strongly than ever, that though she was a lady, Lady Addison, she was still Maddie. First and foremost, she was Maddie. She was strong, and she was brave, and she would not bow down to the whims of any man. And how could that not make me love her? How could it not make me want to possess her? This is so creepy. Oh, crap. He's going to do something awful. Like, it's building up all this, like... Oh, I'm so worried. <laughs> but I knew, if I were to love her too candidly, too brazenly... She would grow to hate me. She 
must have already hated me. Otherwise, she would not have been trying so hard to push me away. Body jerking as though prodded with a pin when she, I cupped her breasts in my hand. Oh, God. I could not see her face, but I thought she might have been crying. Hot, angry tears prickling in the corners of her eyes. Oh my God, just leave her alone. You've already ruined your life. <laughs> Don't make it worse. <laughs> Hatred. She hated me. She hated me. And with every breath, the erratic rising and falling of her chest, she cursed me. If I had not been kissing her so fervently, bloody kisses that stained her teeth red, she would have condemned me to hell. I hate you, Oliver. I really, really hate you. That thought that she might hate me was more terrifying than the thought of being sent away. But no, I would not be sent away because this was not a single kiss. It had escalated to something far, far further than that. Oh no, no. I had intended to kiss her, and only to kiss her, a scandalous act, surely and serious, yes, but not utterly unforgivable. The action of an overly eager man who threw caution to the wind and forgot to tow the line. And who could blame me? Maddie was beautiful. Oh no. <gasps> Is he gonna? Crap, man. Oh no. Maddie was beautiful, but this was not a simple kiss. I was too deeply entrenched, lost in my feelings of love, and I could not let Maddie go. I would die if I'd let her go, even if she was attempting as best as she could to kill me before I could ruin- Oh no, he is gonna do it. She could not do so much with her hands pinned behind her back. She could do less when she was sprawled on the ground, the back of her head hitting a gnarled root with a crack so sickly it almost made me feel breathless. I could hardly breathe at all. Oh my god, he's gonna do it. <laughs> Why? Just freaking crap, man. Maddie was crying. Still, she looks beautiful. I think the tears made her even more beautiful. You're being creepy! This is not love! Oh, crap. Was it really so wrong for me to want to show the woman I love just how deeply my affections ran? Was it so wrong for me to touch her, trailing my fingertips across her pale skin, pressing kisses against her lips, trying to implore her to return my feelings from the bottom of my heart? No, dude, this is... Oh, no, this is not love. I did not think it was wrong, but Maddie did. This is not consensual, that's why. Ugh. <laughs> she must have done. I imagine that she wanted to dig her fingernails into my eyes deep, up into the knuckle, until I cried tears of blood and could never see her pretty face again. I did not deserve to, I, but I could not help myself. Even if Maddie struggled and fought and protested silently every single step of the way, I could not help myself from loving her to such an extent that the thought of being hated made my heart stammer inside my instant I think that's supposed to be inside inside my chest as though it had reached a full stop I could not bear the thought of her hating me so maybe that is why I did it I let my fingertips trail up her smooth smooth skin now exposed beneath the dappled sunlight that filtered from above and tightened them about her throat. <gasps> Don't. Oh, God. <laughs> her lovely, delicate, pale white throat. 
feels better this way, I reasoned as she writhed beneath me. Her skirts rumpled, the curls falling from her hair, the silly strip of ribbon unfurling, untangling, pinned beneath her head and the ground, fluttering in the breeze. This way. I would never have to hear her say it, though I knew. As surely as I knew her struggles were growing less frantic, her irises milky, misty, that she was thinking it. I hate you. Oh my god. If she never said it, perhaps it would never be so. Oh god, is he gonna, he's gonna kill her. Perhaps she would never hate me, and this would never have happened. And I would not be sitting atop her, choking her, while she tried to fight and failed. If I closed my eyes, and I let myself believe we could still be children together, young and naive, and that I was in love with her, and maybe she was in love with me, just a little bit, once upon a time. Man, oh my god. <laughs> wow, that was... Oh man, just all of that build-up was just so scary. Gosh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's like... Oh man. He, he definitely was showing the sign that it just kept building up the creep factor and wow oh man it was it was really good though like i just love the writing in it like oh man <laughs> i'm still still like absorbing all of that like man Whew. It, it kind of it like Anytime that there's something that's like this open-ended, it kind of worries me because I'm like, what happened? I, I'm obviously thinking the worst. I'm like, he murdered her. <laughs> oh, man. So, I guess that's it. Yeah, that's that was Round the Mulberry Bush. <laughs> it was a really good story. It was just really, really disturbing how creepy Oliver was. Like, gosh, man. It, he just turned like an innocent crush into something so so terrifying <laughs> man anyways i hope you guys enjoyed thank you so much for watching <laughs> have a nice day and see you next time bye <laughs>